Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White and welcome to another Myth Salon. Today we have Rob Hopke with us and we're going to talk about synchronicity. But before we begin, as is my practice of doing since we formed the online Myth Salon during the pandemic, I want to devote a moment to just really acknowledging where we are and what dire straits we're still swimming in. We have over 10 million cases in the United States. We're flirting with 250,000 deaths. Every day we're having 2,000 people dying. These are friends, relatives. They're people we know, people we know who we love. And thank God we are at least have the, perhaps the end in sight with a new administration coming in in January and not to have this turn into a, a political situation, but it is political. We, we really need to take action. We need to wear masks. We need to do what we need to do to curtail this thing, not only here in America, but everywhere in the world. This is a, a very serious situation that we, very serious situation. It's just so, with that in mind, I would like to open the Myth Salon with a, a moment of silence. I can never find where they're supposed to go. All right. All right, be serious. Today, I'd like to start with a poem by a Sufi poet, Hafiz, in the 14th century. And Zaman, you'll know this, I'm sure. There is a beautiful creature living in a hole you have dug. So at night, I set fruits and grains and little pots of wine and milk beside your soft earthen mounds. And I often sing. Be still, my friend, you do not come out. I have fallen in love with someone who hides inside you. We should talk about this problem. Otherwise, I will never leave you alone. And I want to thank everyone who consoled me in the last Myth Salon. Um, those of you who know me and those of you who don't, my brother was killed about two and a half weeks ago. And uh, having to do the Myth Salon within a couple of days after that was, was a real challenge. And I really, I really caught the fire of the community and their support and compassion for me. And it has made what I do here all that much more meaningful. So I love you all. And I thank you very much for being with me. The hole that I wrote about in my own poem is what motivated choosing this one. And it won't go away but I've learned how to deal with the whole and it'll go on with me for the rest of my life. So, all right, my friend, Will, how about you come on and take us away? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dana. Uh, good, evening, good evening, everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned last time after Dana uh, shared that poem, uh, it's a real reminder. Uh, I, I did a lot of reflecting afterwards on what this community is and what this group is. And uh, I, I think it's maybe, uh, this may be the, the warmest 
highest level conversation I've ever been a part of, or I'm even sure may even exist. It's really, really something special uh, to have a conversation that we cultivate here as a group at the level that we cultivate it and for it to be so warm and so communal. Um, it's very meaningful. And, and I think that there are a lot of new people here tonight. I know there are actually uh, many people joining us from the event that we did a couple, um, maybe about a month ago, um, a little less than a month ago with uh, Chris Vogler. And so I wanna welcome them and tell them a little bit about our community. Um, we started uh, this group, Myth Salon, in Dana's basement, uh, mostly with uh, graduates from Pacifica Graduate Institute, people with masters and PhDs in depth psychology and mythology and the humanities. Um, and then when COVID hit, we went online and we're able to invite in some other communities that we've all been a part of. Um, a Joseph Campbell Foundation Mythological Roundtable group that I led for years with some friends at the Ojai Foundation. Uh, Mythosophia radio series uh, that I led and still do every now and then in Santa Barbara. And, and we just invited everybody in and uh, started inviting more and more people from more and more mythological and depth psychological communities, different guests, different speakers, different audiences. Uh, different friends have come from all these different places, uh, including film schools and certainly from the screenwriting and filmmaking um, environment. And so uh, one of the things that's kind of anchored us is this meeting place of mythology and psychology and storytelling. And so tonight uh, we'll be talking about synchronicity, which is really one of the sweet spots for this larger conversation. Um, I actually have not written <laughs> this introduction because it wouldn't be very appropriate for an evening on synchronicity. We'll see where everything goes. I expect somewhere interesting that is the case whenever you invite synchronicity into the room. Um, and just to, to connect with what synchronicity is, uh, for those of you who are new, uh, and we'll go deeper into it tonight, of course, um, Jung talks about these kind of statistical anomalies in our lives that show up around the narrative momentum of our lives. And then he gets into the narrative momentum of our lives is built around our own kind of individuation process, our own kind of coming into ourselves. And so uh, for those of you who might not be coming from a psychological or mythological point of view, <clears throat> this, is, this is the study of how uh, the world bends around a character, only we're studying the character that is ourself uh, and recognizing that sometimes the world uh, operates uh, more, in more in terms of a narrative and uh, meaningful context uh, than, than materialistic causality. So uh, with this, I'd like to go ahead and invite uh, all of our panelists into the room and then begin our evening. Uh, you all know Dana White, uh, scholar, author, <laughs> and adjunct faculty member at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Uh, some of y'all saw that he's just launched this uh, set of events or these, this set of videos on the Tao Te Ching. Uh, that I'm really excited about and I hope you all check out. My name is Will Lin. I lightly moderate these myth salons. My PhD is in myth. Uh, I've spent years working for the Joseph Campbell Foundation and building an academic department for filmmakers uh, and performing arts uh, artists at Hushin College. Selena Matthews is a clinical psychologist, author, and keynote speaker who graduated from Pacifica and has been an ever-present participant supporter of this myth salon. Uh, we'd like to welcome and thank Connie Zweig, who helps us invite such amazing guests. Uh, Connie is an internationally renowned psychologist for her work on shadow, whose books include Meeting the Shadow and Romancing the Shadow. Boris Nunley, who will be presenting uh, up later on this uh, fall, actually into the winter, um, is a professor of rhetoric and philosophy at UC Riverside and the author of Keeping It Hush, The Barbershop and African-American Hush Harbor Rhetoric. Uh, Zaman Stanisai is a professor of mythology and political science at Pacifica and Cal State, a poet, linguist, mystic, and Fulbright scholar. Uh, joining us again tonight is Clay Boykin, who's been on a global search in the belief uh, that a new compassionate male is emerging is the new archetype for the 21st century. He's the author of Circles of Men, a counterintuitive approach to creating men's groups, uh, a former U.S. Marine Corps officer and founder of the Men's Fellowship Network Circles of Men project. And joining us tonight for the first time, uh, who helped us a good bit with the Chris Vogler event, Chris Holmes, who is a producer, uh, DJ for Paul McCartney for the last 10 years, who studied mythology and religious belief systems with Jay-Z Smith, Jay Smith under the shadow of Eliada and Doniger at the University of Chicago. And finally, I'd like to welcome our guest tonight. Robert Hopke has been a licensed marriage and family therapist in a private practice in Berkeley, California since 1986. Along with his numerous articles and reviews published throughout the world, he's an author of the best-selling uh, bestseller, There Are No Accidents, Synchronicity in the Stories of Our Lives which has been translated into over a dozen languages, most, re most recently followed by his latest work, There Are No Accidents in Love, Synchronicity in the Stories of Our Families. 
He's lectured and run workshops around the country on the concept of meaningful coincidence for the past two decades. He's appeared on Strange Universe and The Other Side, along with numerous other TV and radio interviews on the topic. And most recently, he was featured in David Skrbala's documentary film, What is Synchronicity, which keep your eye out in the feed. I know we're going to send you all a link to where you can check that out. Uh, beyond his work in the field of synchronicity, Rob's other writings include some now standard scholarly references uh, within the field of analytical psychology, including Young, Jungians, and Homosexuality, Men's Dreams, Men's Healing, a guided tour of the collected works of C.G. Young in the persona, Where Sacred Meets Profane, and for a number of years, he's taught on the faculty of the Institute for Transpersonal Psychology, now Sophia University in Palo Alto, in the areas of Jungian psychology, human sexuality, and spiritual direction. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, looking forward to a synchronistic event. <laughs> Well, it's great to be here, I have to say. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. And, um, you know, I've, I've been lecturing on this topic, uh, really, frankly, for so many years at this point that I've done, you know, I sort of, I sort of joke about it in a way, like, you know, if you want five minutes of synchronicity, I can do five minutes of synchronicity. If you want five hours of synchronicity, I can do five hours of synchronicity. But this is particularly delightful, I think, for me, because you call it the myth salon, and you're actually in my salon, <laughs> like usually I'm in someone else's salon, but here I am in my home, in my home office, and this is my salon. So um, I'm gonna do a little bit of an introduction around how I got into the topic, because I think it's really relevant and it sort of breaks open, I think what I would say is my particular take on synchronicity. Um, it's one of those interesting concepts, of course, that have sort of entered into common parlance. Uh, people often think they know what synchronicity is. Um, and, and you know, I sort of joke about this too when I lecture about it. a lot of people think sting and <laughs> sort of invented the concept of synchronicity because of his album that he entitled Synchronicity. So I sort of a little bit shocked when I sort of introduced Jung. Um, but even so, I think even among Jungians at, at times, I think they don't necessarily... Um, I think give the concept perhaps the importance I think it has. I think it, I think it in a way uh, I've been able to talk about it for the last quarter century, 25 years since the book came out um, because I think it is such a fundamental concept and enables us to go into all kinds of different areas of Jung's psychology pretty easily. It's a very comprehensive way. And of course that, um, that fits because Jung came up with the, Jung coined the word synchronicity. For those that you don't know, Jung coined, Carl Jung coined the concept of synchronicity, the actual word, and did so in 1950. Uh, so it's part of his late work. I mean, Jung died in 61, I think. And uh, so it's part of his later work. And so in a way, it's a very comprehensive concept because it sort of sums up a lot of his other work. And we'll be talking about that. I'll be talking about that tonight. Um, I'm gonna give a, a bit of an introduction, but because again, I sort of take the uh, nomenclature salon somewhat seriously, I'd like to actually have it be somewhat of a salon. Um, I'm kind of a English history podcast addict. And there's, and uh, BBC History Extra has this entire series of podcasts that are sort of um, structured as everything you wanted to know about X, but we're afraid to ask. And the conversation on the podcast is people ask, so what they do is they have their viewers on Instagram or through social media, send them questions about the French Revolution, you know, everything you wanted to know about the French Revolution, but we're afraid to ask. Everything you wanted to know about Stalinism, but we're afraid to ask. Everything you wanted to know about women's suffrage, but we're afraid to ask. So I kind of was thinking like, I think it was a really sort of a great uh, way to do it. And so I have to say, like, I'm really open to questions about synchronicity you might actually have um, about the concept of synchronicity, right? Whenever I give these talks, of course, and I'll talk about this a little bit, some of it's pretty funny because, you know, people will have a synchronistic event and um, want, me to, want me to tell them what it means. I mean, I think that's kind of a, when I say sort of a professional hazard and when you're a therapist, people come to you and they're like, okay, what does this mean? And I'll get into that some, but my book I entitled, There Are No Accidents, colon, Synchronicity and the Stories of Our Lives. And I think Will's brief introduction has it right, which is to say that I take a somewhat, I take a narrative approach to it. What I found out, and 
I'll be demonstrating this, of course, tonight too, is that when a meaningful coincidence or a synchronicity happens to us, um, what sort of immediately occurs is that we automatically tell a story about it. It becomes a story. And I felt like that was an important feature of the actual, uh, the nature of the event, the psychological nature of the event. And I think that that discloses what's at the heart of a synchronistic experience. And um, Jung talked about it in some ways. I flatter myself, I guess, to some extent to think that I um, added a, a different or certain additional features to Jung's discussion that I think help us round out the topic even further and make it a little bit, as a clinician, make it more useful for our, our lives, you know? I mean, they're usually very dramatic kind of events and they uh, make great stories, but I think those stories disclose, the stories we tell about those events disclose something about who we are. So a little background on me, uh, I, I don't think I actually heard the concept of synchronicity until somewhere in the middle of my um, very Freudian psychoanalytic internship I did back in the 1980s. I was working in a, a very, you know, hard, hardcore analytic clinic for my um, hardcore Freudian analytic clinic, right? And I had really actually never read Jung. This is the early 1980s. This was before Jovis of Campbell and PBS. And all I ever heard about Jung, you know, from the Freudians was that he was, you know, was a crackpot and a mystic and, you know, no one to be paid much attention to. So I had this very kind of, you know, uh, hardcore psychoanalytic supervisor. But I had this client, uh, you know, as a youngster, uh, that I was back in the 80s. I had this client, an older man, a lot of mother issues. Uh, and uh, I, he was, you know, I look back now and, you know, it was significant narcissistic pathology. So a very difficult person to work with. Um, somewhat aggressive, somewhat contemptuous, uh, didn't help that he was 25 years older than me. Uh, which was, again was kind of difficult at that period of time, my going into this field directly out of undergraduate school. So I was, you know, I was 23 and I looked all of 23 and I'm there I am the therapist to people in their 50s and 60s. So that was already kind of an awkward situation and he was a prickly personality, but he also had an awful lot of trauma. His mother was quite domineering and bad to him, still in his thrall, still living with her actually in his 50s. And so, you know, they're significant. And, and like a lot of folks in that situation, I'd been through a number of different therapists. He wasn't especially hopeful about our therapy um, and made that kind of clear. So um, I'm struggling along and I'm just learning. I think it was maybe my second or third year of my training. And he is talking about his mother and I'm doing the best I can to kind of empathize, but it's very difficult because, you know, there's a set of defenses up against me. And um, so we meet on Saturday mornings. We're in this tiny little room in the, you know, the clinic that we're, we met in. And it's, uh, I'm up here in Berkeley, California. So we're, it's the winter and we're having a, you know, like a crash bang, terrible storm. We're having like one of these winter storms that's just banging in. So here we are. And so he's there at my, in the session and he's talking about a particular situation with his mother at that time in which he had made a decision, she had undermined his decision and he was just furious at her. And yet, you know, wasn't gonna confront her, didn't know how to confront her, was scared to confront her and kept saying to me, you know, I just feel so powerless. She makes me feel so powerless. I feel so powerless. And at that point, as he's screaming powerless, the lights go off. So all of a sudden in the middle of his expression of powerlessness, we have a literal power failure. Now, you know, I'm a therapist. So, you know, I'm like seeing symbols everywhere. <laughs> you know, those of us that do therapy are symbolically oriented anyway, but you know, we're sitting there in the dark. It wasn't really, it wasn't very easy to like ignore what had just happened. So it wasn't exactly like, you know, I had to look for it. It happened to be, right? So the lights go off and there is some light coming through the window. He's in his, my client's in his space. He doesn't, I think, even really notice the power went off, right? But there I am. And of course, you know, I'm holding the environment and I'm looking at this, but I'm like, okay, the power went off, that's crazy. Well, what happened was sort of because of the semi 
obscurity in which we were actually meeting, I think he sort it sort of calmed him down a bit. He sort of started gathering his thoughts and and um, I was actually able to talk. And I think because the power had gone off, I had a little bit more space to empathize with how impotent, you know, how powerless he must have must felt. You know, my Freudian supervisor probably would have said castrated, right? So, but you know how powerless he felt. That was actually the that was the experience. And so <clears throat> sort of very gently, which was an unusual thing for, you know, it was a, uh, he was an academic in Berkeley. He liked to talk, he liked to argue. Here we were, there was some, the power of failure had actually, the literal power of failure had created some, a different kind of environment. It quieted him down, he gave me some space and sort of gently, I started talking to him about the various ways, things I had been thinking about I had actually discussed with my supervisor, ways in which he did have the possibility or maybe even the capacity to exert a certain level of agency or power in the situation with his mother at home, that he hadn't really availed himself of that, but he could. So that's what I was speaking with him about in a very sort of gentle and empathic kind of way, which he didn't often give me a lot of space for. So I took advantage of it, right? So there I am. And so he's taking this in, again, an unusual situation, him taking in feedback, <laughs> you know, narcissistically inclined people, as we found out in the last four years, generally emit, they don't generally take in. So um, he's taking it and he, and he, he sits with it a bit and he says, so what you're telling me is I'm powerful. I do have power. And I said, yeah, I, I mean, powerful as you want to be, powerful as you want to assert yourself, you know, that we all have agency. There's a way in which you can say yes, say no, open a conversation, start a communication. You know, we don't necessarily always get our way, but yeah, I think you have more power than you actually give yourself credit for and you could use it. And so he sits there and he says, so I'm powerful. I'm powerful. I'm powerful. And all the lights go back on in the room, <laughs> right? I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. This is like, you know, I mean, you know, Will runs a film, film department. I'm like, it's like a movie, right? I mean, it's like kind of nuts. Like if you did this in a movie or a novel, they'd say, what? And so I was just like, whoa, that's kind of wild. The client feels powerless, the lights go off, the client reclaims his power and the lights go on. Um, he doesn't notice that either. He's just, you know, he's in his space. So, um, you know, emitting, not taking in, emitting, right? So he's not taking, uh, uh, but that doesn't matter, right? So we'll talk about that in a bit. So I go to my supervisor and, um, and I tell her the experience. And of course, you know, um, it's, it's one of those experiences that isn't easy to not pay attention to. It was pretty dramatic. <laughs> And she, of course, and, you know, I mean, it killed her to have to say this, but she was like, that's one of those things Jung called synchronicity. And I think that's probably the first time I'd heard the word like in a psychological context. I don't, I probably had heard the word before. And that, so I sort of often tell that story, you know, um, I was a synchronicity virgin before that happened. That was what I was sort of, I was introduced, I was initiated into synchronicity at that point. So that's the first time I heard that the term, right? And I tell that story because, and I tell that I've been telling the story for quite some time. I think it's kind of, it, I start the book with it. It's a perfect kind of story because I think it, um, it illustrates the important aspects of synchronicity as Jung understood it. So Jung wrote the book, that was entitled Synchronicity, colon, an A-causal connecting principle. And he wrote it, it was published in 1950. And he had come up with this concept of synchronicity. And one of the reasons I'm happy to be here at the Myth Salon is that people have taken that concept and run with that concept in a bunch of different directions. And I think uh, um, I'm a bit of a young fetishist. I, I after, uh, the, I heard about Jung and I, in my second master's degree, I actually read the collected works as my actual independent study throughout the two years of my master's degree. So I would, partly because of my Freudian background, the Freudian background training I'd had, 
uh, I realized that people said a lot of things about Jung, but a lot of people hadn't actually read Jung. So I was going to read Jung, and I was interested, and my, a lot of my career has been about um, making sure that people start at the source. This is what Jung came up with. This was his idea of the concept, which isn't to say, you know, he's the alpha and the omega. That's perfectly fine for people to take a concept and go in different directions. But I feel like we should know what Jung meant by the concept first. And if we don't, you know, that's the basic place to start. So what Jung meant by the concept is Jung wanted to take synchronicity and establish it as a psychological concept. It has potentially a spiritual aspect to it. It has potentially a physics aspect to it. But Jung's concept was to establish a psychological principle that was interior, that is to say psychological, on par with the external scientific principle of cause and effect. So in scientific empirical research, you, I turn on the light. And so we're looking at why did that light turn on? And then we explain it with regard to what the cause of that effect was. Jung wanted to establish a psychological principle that was a causal, in which the meaning of the event didn't depend on what had caused it, but on the kinds of connections we make personally in our soul, as he might say, but our psyche makes with the external event. So it's not so much, uh, you know, what caused the light to turn on or off as an explanation done, that's it, but more as a, a causal connecting principle in which two events would be connected because of their psychological meaning to the specific individual. And he felt that, that what he wanted to establish synchronicity as a principle as fundamental to our understanding of ourselves in the world as cause and effect was. It was a rather, you know, it's a rather um, impressive ambition conceptually to speak, you know? So that's why the, the, I sometimes say everything you want to know about synchronicity is in the title of the book. If you really look at the title of the book, synchronicity colon a, a causal connecting principle. So the first aspect of synchronicity, of course, and really I would say the most important one is, is that one, the a causality of it. Now, I have to sometimes make clear that what Jung meant by that was not a non-causal principle. It's an a causal principle. In other words, the connections we make between ourselves and the external event that occurs, the meaning of it is found in its significance to us, not in the causes. There are causes. And you know, I can use the example that I just gave, right? The event was impressive to me because of what it meant and the timing of it. It was a meaningful coincidence. So that's kind of the easy way to, that's sort of the easy common sense way to describe what synchronicity is. It's a meaningful coincidence. It's not just a regular coincidence, it's a meaningful one. Now, obviously the power failure that I experienced at the Unitas agency had been caused by something. You know, a, a, a lightning hit the generator in Richmond, California, and all the lights went out in Berkeley or that area of Berkeley. Okay, well, that's the cause. But explaining that cause doesn't get to how I connected with the event. So that's what Jung's, Jung's coinage of the concept of synchronicity is meant to focus us on. Focus us on. It is designed to draw us into being able to reflect on the inner significance of the event as we connect with it. And that's why it's a causal. The cause of the event doesn't matter with regard to how we connect with it. Explaining the external cause or effect doesn't matter. So it's primarily, I wanna say, a psychological principle. So it's not a scientific principle in the sense of empirical science. It's a psychological principle. And it's the a-causality of it that I think most people have the most difficult time with. We're not used to dealing with phenomena in an, in an a-causal 
or non-causal fashion. And so what people will often want to do is create what I sometimes call theories of occult causality with regard to these events. So in other words, you know, and, and I, you know, I'll sort of tell on ourselves, you know, California is especially kind of, Californians especially are into this, what I have to say, <laughs> other parts of the country there, you know, they don't quite have sort of, um, don't quite have the sort of, what do I say, vocabulary interests that we have here. You know, people will want to say, well, you know, the clients, the power of the client's feeling sent vibrations out into the world and turned the lights off or on. And I'm like, well, I mean, Jung would be the first to say, yeah, that might have happened. But that's a causal explanation. That's a occult causal explanation in that sense, right? I mean, it's something we can't really prove. And in a way, it doesn't matter because the impact of it on me symbolically was the meaning of the event. So whether the client did or didn't, or whether it was just simply, you know, your random generator in Richmond, which I'm more inclined to believe, to tell you the truth, uh, it, you know, for obvious reasons, <laughs> uh, uh, that's sort of aside. So that's what the a causality of it is intended, is intended to kind of um, focus us on, less on what it is out there and focus us more on what it is in here. So that's that. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm sure there'll be questions about that because um, I always get questions about that. But, you know, to start with the most fundamental piece of it, Jung wanted to establish this as a principle of internal meaning, not external explanation. So that's often what happens because it's so subjective. And I would say, you know, another reason that synchronicity is so emblematic of Jung's thought, right? I mean, Jung is the premier champion of subjectivity. I mean, really, you know, the psyche is what creates the world uh, for Jung in a certain sense. And so what happens, what we call internally, you know, what happens psychically to us is what is how we understand the world. So that the meaning of it really is the creation of the event in a particular way, to say that. So that's the first and most important part. You know, I'll, I'll, I think I've said what I can say at, the, at this moment about that. The second most important part is, you know, sort of what you notice in a synchronistic event, in a meaningful coincidence. Um, one of the most important um, questions I frequently get is, you know, and I had to actually deal with when I was writing about this is what does meaning mean? What, what does meaning mean, you know? Uh, and you know, definitely a deep, discussion, particularly in German philosophy for years, was is Bedeutung, what does meaning mean? I take a clinician's approach to that. And um, and I and so what I what meaning means, I think, are the three subsequent aspects to synchronistic events that I write about and talk about frequently. Um, it's meaningful, um, an event is meaningful, a coincidence is meaningful if it has an emotional impact on you. So I feel like, you know, you know, that's where I would say there are ordinary coincidences that occur all the time that are not especially emotionally impactful. You know, I'm doing a crossword puzzle. The clue is singer from Hoboken, seven letters and a Frank Sinatra song comes on. And I'm like, oh, well, that's great, you know, Sinatra. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that was the most emotionally impactful coincidence, right? That it helped me finish my crossword puzzle or, you know, I'll bump into a neighbor I haven't seen for a while. Well, that's a coincidence in that sense, you know, and I might have just been thinking of her, but, you know, it's sort of an, an ordinary coincidence. There are ordinary coincidences. The coincidences that Jung is talking about synchronistically have much more impact on us emotionally. They're a little bit more like the incident I described and some of the other stories. Uh, I'm sure I'll hear from some of the people as well as maybe talk about. So emotional impact is really is extraordinarily important around that. That's what it makes. That's what what makes something meaningful, meaningful. So what you'll notice there, and this is another thing, you know, yeah, people will come up to me and say, is this, they'll tell me a story and they'll say, is that synchronicity? And I'm like, you decide whether it's synchronistic, you know, synchronicity is not out there. It's thick in here. In other words, is it emotionally impactful? Did that, did that coincidence have an emotional impact on you? And if so, what? Which is why I use that illustration because as I said, 
I noticed the lights went on and off at particular times. My client didn't. You know, the event was synchronistic for me as the therapist. It opened my eyes to a particular experience or um, kind of experience that I was going to go on and have with multiple clients. You know, I had many, I had, I'll tell you some of these stories, many, many synchronistic events that occurred actually in the psychotherapy situation, in the actual psychotherapy session with clients, as did Jung, you know, the famous scarab beetle story that he tells in which he's talking to a client about a dream she had and she dreamt of this scarab beetle. And lo and behold, through the open window of his office, this beetle flies in and lands, lands on his desk while he's talking to her about a dream about a beetle. And he's like, and there is your scarab, you know, like that's kind of, he has a synchronistic event that occurs. It's emotionally meaningful, you know, because, it, because of the timing of it, which is an important piece of it. It's a coincidence. Coincidences are essentially about timing. The time something happens, is key to making it a coincidence. And it's not just the regular flow, but coincidence, right? But the emotional impact of it is a, the second most important aspect of synchronistic events. So yeah, I mean, I, you know, I have people come up to me and it's like, this, this one woman, God bless her, you know, she's, she's like, oh my God, you know, my cat was walking across the couch and I thought it might fall and it did. And I'm like, okay, um, you know, let's talk about what that meant. I, it could be synchronistic. Let's describe it. You know, like, the, is it emotionally significant? The third, you know, the scarab beetle story, I just told my own story about my client. The third aspect, and again, a hallmark of Jungian thought and his approach to life uh, is that syn synchronistic events usually have an important symbol at their core. They're symbolic. So that's what distinguishes an ordinary coincidence from a synchronistic event, is there's usually a powerful symbol that's at the core of it all in some fashion. What's a symbol? You know, uh, I mean, Jung's definition is a symbol is an image that points to something greater than itself. So I'll say that again. A symbol is something, is an image that points to something greater than itself. So the power failure, for example, the fact the lights went off is symbolic because it points to, it, it concretizes, it images the internal emotional environment of my powerless client. It's symbolic. Now, as I said, as I told the story, you know, the, those of us that go into psychotherapy and those of us that are here at the Myths a lot, I think are probably inclined to be bringing a very symbolic attitude to life. You know, we see things around us and we allow ourselves to let those images, those objects, those experiences have an internal meaning for us that points to something greater than ourselves, transpersonal to some extent, uh, greater than the object itself. Um, you know, I, I think we go about it all the time. I mean, you know, a little synchronistic event here. Um, here I am, like I think, you know, the entire country, you know, riven with anticipation slash anxiety about the outcome of the election. Uh, you know, I'm calling on all my angels and saints that there's a good outcome. I'm not going to get into the pros or cons of it, but I was just like, you know, whatever happens, I want a good outcome for the country, regardless of who actually takes office. I want a good outcome. So uh, for years, literally for 10 years, I have this thing, this plant growing on my uh, pergola in the backyard. And uh, my late husband, whose birthday it is, today. Uh, he passed away eight years ago. And I planted it 10 years ago, this bougainvillea. Oh my God, when is the bougainvillea going to bloom? Bougainvillea, they're really fussy. They require special kinds of circumstances. They don't bloom very easily. Once they're blooming, you're great. But this thing finally got established. We must have planted six of them in the yard. Finally, this one's established. It's huge. It's all over the pergola, nothing but green leaves, no flowers. 
it's planted so long ago, I don't even know what color it is, right? And I'm like waiting for it every year. Is it gonna bloom? Is it gonna bloom? Is it gonna bloom? So here we are, it's Wednesday morning. None of us slept on Tuesday night, I'm sure. I didn't sleep on Tuesday night. I was like, okay. And then of course you wake up on Wednesday morning and they're like, okay, you're gonna have to wait. You're gonna have to wait. And I'm like, okay, this is terrible. I go out in the backyard and it has bloomed, except it's not a bougainvillea. It's a Trump it vine. I'm like, it's a Trump it's vine. I go to the, <laughs> it gets better. So I'm like, okay, that's crazy. So there's these, it's a red trumpet vine. I mean, they're pretty common, right? But I'm like, for 10 years, I think this thing's a bougainvillea the day after the election, a trumpet vine blooms in my yard. And I'm like, okay, now I don't know how I feel about that to tell you the truth, a trumpet vine in my yard. So I go to the nursery and I've been a picture of it on my phone here, right? And I look at it and he, and he says to me, it gets even better. He says to me, yeah, it's, he called it a Mexican blood vine. And I'm like, whoa, I'm like a Mexican blood vine bloomed in my yard the day after his, uh, his election. I'm like, wow, again, a symbol. Symbols don't have a singular meaning. They have a multiplicity of meanings. I would even say they have an infinite, potentially infinite uh, set of meanings. But uh, the meaning of the symbol is determined by you, not by it. So that's often, again, I think, you know, I like to talk about this to particularly folks who may not necessarily be all that familiar with the concept of synchronicity or Jung at all right? It's a great way to get into Jung's way of thinking about things. People will come up to me and say, like, I, you know, uh, I've dreamt about whales, I've dreamt about whales, and now all of a sudden, you know, my niece, without even talking to her, my niece sent me a picture of a whale that she had drawn in school. What do whales mean? They tell me. And I'm like, <laughs> it's not, the meaning of the symbol is not out there under the rock. You don't pick up, you don't pick the rock up and say, okay, oh, that's it. You know, Jung actually, if you want to read Jung, he's actually kind of, you know, he throws a lot, of, as we would say these days, throws a lot of shade at these like dream manuals in which you, you know, you look up for the, you know, okay, this is what, you know, chopping wood means. This is what a cigar means. This is what a banana means. This is what a pencil means. You know, he sort of, you know, that we have them we have them still but you know he was like his thought he was a clinician his vocation was to sit with a person across from him and help that person understand themselves that was the point of it so that's the way in which his concept of synchronicity fits into the larger program of his desire to help people in their individuation process, their process of becoming integrated in themselves as the person they are. And one important instrument in that is developing the person's capacity to work with symbolic material in their own life. Now, that's why he does dream work, right? Because every night we dream, we have symbols of the unconscious presenting themselves to us. So that, that's part of my work, that's part of Jungian work in general, is to work with the spontaneous, the way in which we spontaneously as human beings generate symbolic material to understand that, right? Synchronicity is from the outside in. In other words, the symbols that we are encountering in a synchronistic event, because of their emotional impact, which we did not cause ourselves, even occult in an occult fashion, didn't cause ourselves, it's a random event, has an emotional impact on us, we respond immediately to a synchronistic event by experiencing that event as symbolic. And that's the tenor of the discussion about it. In other words, when I discuss it, I really, I deal with it as if it were a waking dream, as if it had actually occurred, you know, as that, like, so that's what I would say with a Trump at Vine uh, bloomed in my yard. What does that mean? Is it a sign of hope? 
Is it, uh, is it, uh, you know, it's a Mexican blood vine. Is it nature's protestation around the oppression of Mexican people and immigrants? Is it a sign of victory? Is it a sign I'm wrong about things? I thought it was a bougainvillea and it was completely something else, you know? I, there's a multiplicity of ways that you explore a symbol and, you, and one never gets the, to the end of that exploration with a symbol, really. And uh, so I guess that's maybe I'll, where I'll leave that particular aspect of it. Those three aspects are in Jung. He talks, if you pick up synchronicity and a cause, you can't even talk about all of those, the a-causality, the emotional impact, the symbolic nature of synchronistic events. The fourth is my, a little bit my personal contribution to the literature. And, and it came, came about through um, the research that I was doing, talking, you know, I had synchronicity brunches. I had, <laughs> and all my friends get together and tell me about their synchronicity stories over, you know, omelets and coffee and stuff. I had all kinds of things. I had, you know, I did a lot. Of, I talked for about two years. I talked to, you know, hundreds of people about their synchronicity stuff and solicited stuff. It became sort of clear to me that what was happening, what, and it made sense at the time, it made sense at the time, still does. Um, I noticed that these synchronistic events seem to occur in times of transition for people. <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, Jungians and psychologists in general, and although it's now kind of in common parlance back when it was sort of in psychology, they've adopted the anthropological term liminal to describe it. They're liminal phenomena. What liminal means, limin comes from the Latin word threshold. And to the, so to describe something as liminal phenomena means that it is occurring in a, a middle stage of a process. It's drawn from the anthropological um, description of night, rites of initiation. So that was originally where it was used. It was used in anthropology. Rites of initiation have someone, so when a, when a young man or woman are, is being a, initiated into adulthood, in, in, a, in a more indigenous or tribal sort of situation. What the anthropologist notices is that there are three stages of it. There's the removal stage. You know, the child is removed from their usual environment of childhood, brought out to the woods, made to go on a vision quest. Some, they're removed. There's a middle stage in which they've been, they're no longer a child, but they're not yet an adult. They're in a middle betwixt and between stage. And it's one of the times when the most mystical aspects of the initiation rite generally occur or are made to occur, right? And then there's the reincorporation phase in which the child is then brought and made and recognized back in the community as a full-fledged adult. The middle stage is what the anthropo anthropologists called liminal. And it's sort of a big fancy word for transitional. You know, it's a, it's a point at which you aren't there any longer but you haven't yet gotten to where you're going and it's somewhere in between. Jungians liked that term back in the day, still do, still do like that term because they felt like it described the experience of analysis, the actual experience of psychotherapy was essentially liminal. The person removes themselves from their actual physical outside environment, places themselves in this liminal space before they then go out of the therapy session at the end or the analysis as a whole as a new person. So liminal is, you know, therapy as a transitional liminal space is was very much in vogue and it still is. I think it's an, actually a very um, cogent way to describe what the process is. I noticed that synchronistic events seem to occur to the people I was talking to at the, at a liminal point, a transitional point in their lives, the event punctuated a transition they were making. Sometimes that transition was conscious. So obviously if, you know, Jung's client comes in, plunks herself down in front of him and tells him her dream, she's conscious about wanting to make a transition. She doesn't like what's gone on in her life. She's seeking psychotherapy to change it. And she's hoping she's actually going to get a result. That's kind of why we do it. <laughs> that's the point. So that's sort of presumed. She's in a liminal space in Jung's office. And so that's why the scarab comes in and this thing like lands on her, right? That's the point. So sometimes the transition I found was intentional, like people intended to it. 
people are looking, I have some stories, I have stories in the book about people who were changing careers or wanted to change careers and certain things occurred coincidentally that allowed them to do that. The ones that I find a little bit more intriguing or interesting are the ways in which trans, uh, um, synchronistic events punctuated transitions the person was making that they were unconscious of. They didn't know they were making the transition until the synchronistic event occurred and brought their attention to it. So I think those are a little bit more interesting, you know, to some extent. And like an example of that, for example, is a, a story that I, I tell in the book of this, um, of this client, you know, who uh, was really kind of, uh, sort of very happy in her life, you know, wasn't seeking a relationship at all. And through a weird series of different kinds of wrong numbers that she got, she actually ended up connecting with this guy who had the exact same name as the person who she was trying to call, except that when she called the number, she called the wrong number when she was trying to get a hold of him. And she talked to the a guy with the exact same name as the guy she was trying to call in New York City. And she ended up having a relationship with him. In other words, it was a transition she didn't know she was making into relationship through a weird series of coincidences that she now looks back on. It was like, oh, this whole series of strange wrong numbers and me trying to find his number in a phone book and then calling the wrong person. And then that person and I get to talking and I end up actually going out with him instead of the other person who had the exact same name as the person. I, it was this strange series of coincidences, a transition she didn't know she was making. She was like, okay, I really wasn't intending to get into a relationship. And now here I am, I married him. You know, she actually ended up marrying him. So those are some of the, so that's another example of a transition. Sometimes we don't even know we're making a transition. You know, we don't, we know maybe on an unconscious level, this job is not, the, another story I have, right? <laughs> a, a, client, a, a clinician colleague told me this story. She was working at this agency, it was a horrible abusive agency. She, she, and she needed the job. She had three kids, single mom. She couldn't quit. So she just couldn't imagine kind of like just quitting the job, right? But she had some knowledge on the unconscious level she needed to get out of there. And there she is, you know, she lived down here on the peninsula up here in the Bay Area. And so she had to take Caltrans into the city. <laughs> and she's sitting there and she's just like, you know, hating the idea that she's got to commute into this job. And the train pulls into the station and blows up in front of her, like ex the engine explodes in front of her. And of course she's a therapist, right? So we're all, as I said, sort of symbolically inclined. And she was like, that's it. <laughs> I mean, like, do I need a clearer sign that this job is done than the train I'm supposed to get onto to go to this job just blew up in front of my face. And at that point, you know, she was like, I need to get out of this place. That's, you know, she tells me the story because it was so, it's so dramatic, right? I mean, this is a very, very dramatic kind of situation. So sometimes the coincidences are like the power failure or a train blowing up. Sometimes they're a little bit more subtle or sort of strung out over time, like my friend Jill's story of all the various different Richard Rosenbergs she called until she actually managed to get together with the guy that she's with. Um, so, you know, it isn't the drama that makes it synchronistic. It's the meaning of it. It's what you make of it. So, you know, to get maybe to a close, so we can get a little bit to discussion. I sort of encountered this in writing the book, in writing the book or when people read the book, people are like, well, uh, the subjectivity of it all, I, you know, maybe not for us, but for some people it troubles them. You know, they're just like, oh, well, how do you know that that's what it means? Aren't you just reading meaning into these events? You, are you, you know, you're like, she's just making it up. And I always, I bust out laughing because I'm like, uh, yeah, that's kind of the point. Like a, like I said, the meaning of the event is not out there under a rock to be discovered. And I think like, I say to them like, well, every important aspect of humor, human culture in a particular way you could say was made up. You know, if you do an art, if you do a per piece of art, that piece of art didn't exist before you made it up. 
if I write a book, I made it up. Like the point, Jung's point was to empower people's ability to derive meaning from the random events that occur to them over the course of their life to make meaning of the flow of the various events. And the principle by which we do that is what he would call the self. You know, uh, Dana's lovely poem at the beginning of this, I think provides a beautiful image of the self. In other words, you know, I fell in love with someone you don't even know you are. In other words, there's our self, little s, or little ego, our concept of ourself that walks around. And then there's a capital S self. There's the fuller you or me that we aren't ever fully conscious of. <clears throat> Synchronistic events are one way to draw our attention to aspects of who we are that we're walking around unconscious of. And it does it through and the emotional impact of it. It does it through the symbolic power of it. And if we meet those events and make a narrative of it, Jung wants us to do that. We want, it, the point of it is to make meaning on the basis of who we are at the deepest level. And so when people read into the random events of their lives and make stories, what they're doing is they're integrating themselves. They're bringing their unconscious forward and making the fuller, larger self that's been in the darkness of the hole back here, bringing it out into the light. Synchronistic events are one way that those meaningful coincidences, the coincidences that occur to us that we experience spontaneously, I think, as meaningful um, in the moment a lot of times, or subsequently when we look back on the series of events and you're like, oh my gosh, if that hadn't happened, if that hadn't happened, if that hadn't happened, I would not be who I am. That's Jung's point. Jung's point is to make meaning of our lives. And that's why I like the concept of synchronicity a lot. I think like there's a way in which it opens up almost all of Jung's psychology and a psychological theory and his understanding of the psyche. And it also is a, an extraordinarily useful concept clinically. And it, it leads to a certain level of creative living uh, for folks, um, you know, if you, if you're not, if you aren't going to bring us, if you don't bring a symbolic attitude toward your life, you will miss a great deal of what you could be experiencing. And so I feel like synchronistic events are sometimes, you know, a kind of a random reminder from our deep unconscious, frankly, not from the outside in, but from our deep unconscious that, yeah, this is meaningful, pay attention. You know, I'll probably tell more stories in response to some of the questions, but yeah, I'm interested in hearing what people have to say or want to ask or discuss or argue with or affirm. I'd love to hear synchronistic stories too, of course. It, you know, telling synchronous stories usually brings forward synchronistic stories and, uh, you know, they're always very delightful to hear because they're always super meaningful, so. Well, I thought I actually might, might start uh, Break the Ice with a story. Um, thank you, first of all. Uh, really wonderful introduction to synchronicity and uh, seriously, uh, uh, <laughs> even my relationship with it. I have some questions, but before getting to those, I thought, um, you know, I'd share a synchronistic story that happened when we did the Writer's Journey event <laughs> uh, just not so long ago. We're getting ready. It's, everything's about to happen. Uh, 10 minutes before, 15, 10 minutes before uh, before the time, I think five o'clock, uh, all of a sudden uh, we're, we're set up. It's like, you know, do, 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 you know, all good. <laughs> and uh, then all of a sudden computer glitch. 15 minutes have to redo everything. And we're, and everybody all of a sudden, every single person involved had to do something <laughs> it was an extra challenge had to find everybody and some things some people more than others and you know we got to the other side of it and I realized that what that had done like almost cheesily cheesy and obnoxious <laughs> it's so ridiculous but what that had done is it had turned the event on the hero's journey into its own hero's journey where everybody was on a hero's journey in the middle of the event trying to make sure that the event happened and to uh resist the forces of chaos and to make sure we came through to the other side uh, <laughs> uh but it was, it was so meaningful and it was so interesting and of course you look back on it and you're like oh this is a 
you know, a, a kind of 25 year event on, on this theory. Isn't it only makes sense that the theory would have, the medium would have become the message, right? And the experience would have become the conversation. And, and that's what it did. And, and whether, it was, whether it was metaphysically empowered or not, the meaning was unescapable. Right. I mean, that's the point of it. The point of it is not so much, you know, complete computer glitches happen all the time, right? But, you know, you notice that when you, this is why Jung coined the concept. He wanted to provide language for what you did with the event, what all of you did with the event, which is sort of live symbolically into it, you know, enrich your experience of what's going on outside, you know, and not just sort of sleep your way through life, you know, that's kind of like what happens. So, you know, partly there too, I think, you know, you, in addition to that, you know, the symbol in that particular instance is archetypal, you know, a hero, you know, it's sort of the hero's journey, you're sort of, you know, all symbols, you know, might have an archetypal base or root to them, not necessarily every single symbol, but, you know, what's the archetypal thing here, you know, your hero's journey is like really great, you know, in addition to the, um, you know, it's always sort of very interesting, another aspect of this, of course, built into it is timing, right? I mean, here you are 15 minutes before, except that every single person was late to the event so that you actually had the time, you know, like there are these kind of strange, um, these strange kind of stories of like, oh my God. Uh, and, and I always remember this too, from all my work and all the stories I've heard, whenever I'm late to something or something has broken down, I remember all the stories, synchronistic stories I have of people who avoided catastrophe because they had been delayed or showed up to something that changed their life because the timing was off and they actually got there early. You know, that in other words, I'm like always uh, very, very, so I tell a story in this latest book of a, a colleague of mine who has this like nebbish brother who like bugs him all the time and called, he's uh, rushing to get out of work when we all went to work, rushing to get out of work to get to San Francisco. And his brother constantly would call him and kind of keep him on the phone and delay him and it was actually my colleague's wife who pointed out that every time his brother did that, he avoided a catastrophe on the road. There was a huge accident on the Bay Bridge once, or there was some a BART delay or something. Every time his brother like delayed him, it was it actually enabled him to avoid some kind of commute catastrophe. And it was his wife who pointed it out. It's like, you know, the last three times he called, there something went on. So like that story, the timing aspects of it are just so, um, I don't know what, call, you know what to call it, sort of almost ineffable. Like it defies explanation. And yet time, the nature of time, how we experience time chronologically, psychologically, metaphysically, as you just said, what is time? What does it mean for something to be coincident? You know, like does time exist in the psyche? You know, we think of our, we experience events sort of sequentially. And so something is synchronistic because it coincides with it, but is that actually get to the root of what its actual nature is in, intrapsychically where time Ooh. doesn't exist, you know? So yeah, it's sort of, that's another one of those aspects that that story sort of brings up the timing aspect of it. I think that's always pretty delightful. <laughs> When I was in college, I remember uh, thinking that I understood everything I read in my philosophy major, whether I did or not. But I remember one particular thing. I just the one thing that stood out is the thing that I knew I did not understand at all was when Immanuel Kant said that time is the dimension of the soul. And uh, only <laughs> the about synchronicity has helped me with that. By the way, since I have, I called, uh, you know, we're, we're we're still close to the debates and debate rules. Uh, I, I evoked. Chris Holmes, and so <laughs> he actually was involved in that event. So I want to see if he if he wanted to come in on that conversation. Yeah, totally. Uh, hi, Robert. Um, hey, Chris. I wanted to talk to you about synchronicity and creativity. Um, I, I've found that there's a distinct connection between flow states in my life and synchronous moments where I will have these things that are coincidence that, that happen that are so far beyond probability. I'll give one example where I used to go uh, to Iceland and I would make no plans so I could be in the moment and just deal with stuff. And I was at a party at someone's house and, and as I'm, you know, I'd make no plans and I'd just show up. As I was at this house, there happened to be a TV on in the background and it had, there was one American show that was on in Iceland at the time and it was the Jerry Springer show. 
And I had gone with a friend to an episode like four years before, but right as I enter the house, there's a close up of my face on the TV. And uh, that's crazy. And this trip, there was like four or five things that happened like that. But but what I found in my life is that when I can get into these flow states, there's almost like this cosmic resonance. And I think you 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 touched on it where we find the significance. But like I found in my own life that I have these liminal kind of personal heroes journey things that I'm going through or challenges that I'm facing. And when I can get to that moment of flow and and kind of let go of that ego self and connect to that capital S self, that I have these coincidences that happen all around me. Um, is it you know, that I'm looking for them or that my brain's kind of like amped up to see them because it's so far beyond probability when they happen. It's like, you know, there was a small one that happened like during the quarantine. Um, you know, we had we had a lot of trouble with uh, with like meth encampments and stuff. And there was a literal dumpster fire in front of our house that kind of what we were talking about. I was like, oh, this here's a dumpster fire. And they open up the door and there's literally a dumpster on fire across the street from our house. Right, right. That's like a small coincidence. Like, but like there are things that are happening that are so far beyond probability. And and what I've I've kind of taken out of it personally is that when those things happen, they kind of let me know that I'm on the right track in my journey and that I should step up and face those challenges and stuff. But do you have any connections with with creativity and these synchronous experiences? Well, um, I mean, you're speaking wonderfully to it, I have to say. I mean, you're quite articulate about it. I mean, the create any kind of creativity comes by through a liminal space is putting yourself into a transitional space, which you're doing quite intentionally. And, I, and most artists do, you know, you're calling it flow. Another great, you know, Stephen Thaly's great way to talk about it, right? I guess what I was struck by more is sort of your face on the TV screen in Iceland, let me just say, because <laughs> it made me think something that Jung said, and actually James Hillman, you know, Jung's follower, um, uh, says too, you know, Jung was like, the psyche is not in us, we're in the psyche. And I almost want to say like, you know, what he means by that, I mean, he did, he wouldn't go there because he's not a philosopher, he's a psychologist, he's looking at the psyche. But, you know, Hillman does, you know, it's like, you know, we're not in the cosmos, the cosmos is in us. And I feel like that's a synchron your synchronistic moment. I was like, okay, you may be there, but you're kind of, you are everywhere. <laughs> like, you know, you are, you are the cosmos, you know, I feel like, and, and in a way, kind of the way you plan those trips was intended specifically for you to have a much more conscious experience of that. So in a way, it's sort of like, I would expect your, face to show up on the TV screen in Iceland, because that's kind of the purpose of that journey, those journeys, it sounded to me like you're opening yourself up to, you know, and that's what the concept of synchronicity allows us. It's an a causal connecting principle. It's connecting. It's the way in which, you know, creativity is about using the medium, using the media to create something, whatever the media might be, to create something that reflects our internal. And so there's this connection between the, what we experience as interior or subjective private individual and the external that everyone can see, touch, taste, see on the, see on the screen, you know, experience in the food, whatever the create, you know, particular creative work happens to be. It's a connecting principle. So yeah, I, um, <laughs> I, I sometimes joke somewhat ironically because people are always like, how can I make synchronicities happen to me? And I'm like, you didn't hear anything I said, did you? <laughs> if you don't make them happen, they're a causal. But I'm like, I generally like, you know, as a good clinician sort of take a moment and say sometimes uh, sarcastically, if you want a synchronicity to happen, try to plan things as obsessively as you possibly can, because something unexpected, like Will's story, something unexpected will occur. And that's where the meaning of the event might be found. You know, that's our ego plans things, you know, so, and our self manifests itself through the cracks in our planning. So I always, you know, I have to say, I always have to remind myself of that, you know, especially reminding myself of it this week, you know, because every election, someone wins and someone loses. So, you know, we have to kind of deal with what is in some sense, you know, so this week is, a, you know, one example of that, like, 
expect the unexpected. And if you expect the unexpected, you can find um, meaning in it if you're actually oriented to looking for that. So that's a really great summary of, of you, you know, it's, it's, I think so much of it is like set and setting. And if you're expecting to open your heart and to kind of experience these things, you'll, you'll find them. Uh, and yeah, thank you for, for that. That was great. Right. Robert, thank you so much. That was such an inspiring, incredible. <laughs> and well, I thanks, love Lena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a clinician. And I wanted to, to say to you, it's, um, I, you know, sometimes we work with people who have absolutely no ability to have any symbolic aspect. It's true. And, and, and we have to, over time, water the seeds of, okay. of all of that. And so I just want to share a client who came in initially, I'll call her Jackie, who came in the first six months, she cried every session. Oh. Okay, major depressive disorder. Cut to uh, a year and a half later, she called me yesterday, talk about being synchronistic and right. said, so Oh my God, I had this synchronistic experience. I was in an Uber and the song, her husband was a, a very famous uh, songwriter in the 60s and 70s. And his song came on and I hadn't heard it in years. And she cried and that Uber driver, God bless him, sat with her. And as she, she cried, she told, he she told him all the songs that her husband wrote and and it was, it was amazing from nothing to this experience. Um, anything is possible. And I know, I think your point that there is a transition in her therapy occurred in the Uber. Right. No question about it. And I'm excited where she's gonna go. But as you know, it is a journey with all these clients that start with nothing. Right. No, for sure. I mean, I think, in fact, in a way, uh, many <laughs> clients who might be sort of a, mm, sensation types, as we would say, right? Not especially intuitive, therefore not especially adept at using the language of symbols, often seek Jungians out, right? Because they're reading about, you know, they read Jung and they're like, I want some of that. Only they're not very good at it, but you are correct. It certainly can be watered and developed, you know, for sure. I mean, that's that's our work, right? That's our work to do that, right? And, you know, we do that in a wide variety of ways. And, you know, I, I certainly dreams is one way to do it. I mean, that's a lovely story, I think, because it sort of demonstrates something which I'll, you know, I've been talking about a lot, I guess, particularly in the last four years, right? Um, which is empathy, right? <clears throat> if a synchronous, if the meaning of a synchronistic event is entirely subjective to the individual, you on the outside, you or me or anyone really, frankly, is not going to understand what the meaning of the event is to the individual unless we have the capacity for empathy. Without if question. we can't put ourselves in that person's position and feel what they're feeling, the meaning of that event will be opaque to them, to you. It'll be opaque, you won't understand it. To which, so then what happens, and I think we've seen this a great deal in the culture at large, then people deny that it's meaningful because they don't understand the meaning because they don't have the instrument of empathy to allow them to enter into the other person's experience to understand it. So it's not that the experience has no meaning, it's that the person is deaf to the meaning because the pathway into it is empathy. And that's what opened your client up. This Uber driver had empathy for what she was experiencing. It's just a human to human connection. But you know, empathy has gotten a really bad rap, you know? I mean, we have political conventions in which people are wearing t-shirts that say, fuck your feelings, right? I'm like, okay, or I have, oh, I have gotten, I can't tell you how many dust ups I've gotten into with my own peer group, my own, you know, boomer generation parents, 
all of whom are mocking their children for having feelings about this political event, that particular defeat, this specific event that happened in school, snowflakes, there's snowflakes, they need to toughen up, they need to this, they need to that, they need to this. I, first of all, I wanna say, if they, maybe they have feelings in spite of you, but they are your children. So you raise them that way. So like you're blaming them for who they are. Like you're responsible for that. That's you, you are the parents, by the way. Nevertheless, I've really gone to the mat, you know, for example. So here we have like, you know, before the election happened, the, the Dean of Rutgers University um, said, suggested, suggested, not demanded, but suggested to the faculty that in the days post-election, the faculty might postpone uh, papers and tests because the student body might have very strong reactions to the result of the election, whatever those might be, negative, positive, whatever. Oh my God, the dust up among my peer group. I can't believe they're like, they just need to get to work, blah, 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 blah. And now, I mean, the president of the United States is having a meltdown about the results of the election, <laughs> right? In other words, everyone deserves empathy, frankly, whether it's the president of the United States or whether it's your children. You know, if you don't cultivate an empathic response, you are not going to understand the meaning of the event for the person. And so I feel like that's what comes through in that story. You know, she, very, a very lovely story. You know, she happened upon a complete stranger who might have, who had empathy for her and understood. It's a very human experience, which gets me to, you know, I'll do this quickly too, because it's, you know, kind of an endless topic, but um, there are basic human experiences we all have, you know, her loss around her husband and connected with some loss that the Uber driver could relate to, empathize with, understood from his own life or her own life, right? And so that's what Jung calls an archetypal experience. We have a collective unconscious. There are certain experiences we all go through in life. We were born, we die, we experience loss, we experience victory, we experience confusion, there are parts of who we are that are wise. There are parts of who we are that are stupid and foolish. Those are archetypes. They're typical experiences, archetypal experiences of the collective unconscious. We all have five fingers. We all have two ears. We have common physical characteristics. We have common psychological experiences just because we're all human. And that's the deepest level of connection we have with everyone. You know, so I feel like that's my quick and easy way of describing, you know, the archetypes of the collective unconscious, common human experiences. And when we tap into them, we have that deep connection. And so many of the symbols that occur in uh, synchronistic events have at their core an archetypal root, something that enables us to connect with other people. And so I have to say, you know, the experience of loss, death is... Um, archetypal. You know, so I, it, like in the book, for example, I tell many stories. I have an entire chapter on the two major transitions we make, born into life <laughs> and die out of life. Those are like the two major transitions we all make. So there are all kinds of synchronistic events around births and deaths. In fact, I think if I do a third book on this, it'll be stories of synchronicity and death. Uh, you know, at age 62, having gone through many, many deaths of many, many significant people in the course of my life at, at this age, it, you know, and as I reach the latter third of my own life and look at my own death, it's sort of a, a rich area of exploration. You know, how does, how does, a, how do synchronistic events bring our attention to the transition out of this life into death? But that's, what I think, also at the core of the story you told. You know, all of us can relate to having lost someone that we love and remembering them, and, you know, and I just feel like, you know, to cultivate the instrument of empathy for connection enables us to have a richer experience of our life. So, you know, I've been railing about it because empathy has gotten a really bad rap over the last four years, you know, being tough and being in control and being powerful and not em empathizing has been sort of, is a way that I think a lot of folks have gone about 
attempting to try to feel better about themselves, be more powerful. And I actually think um, it works to some extent, but it's also brittle and fragile and not realistic because we're not always, you know, in power and control. Uh, many times we're weak, vulnerable, lose elections, uh, don't get what we want, um, miss the train, don't get hired for the job. You know, that's, a, the, uh, that's an archetypal experience too, that, you know, could open us up if we use it and sit with it in humility, we could actually, it, 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 it enables us to open up to other people and have a fuller experience of our own life. So, I mean, empathy, oh, all of us therapists are empathy champions, so, <laughs> <you're> not, <laughs> so. Rob, uh, just because uh, you're so close to the question that uh, Kay Hecker was asking in the audience, I wanted to bring it in. So you, maybe there's a, a couple extra notes on how the, how synchronicities may be supercharged by traumas. You're talking about how they constellate around deaths and transitions in life. Uh, she mentions that um, uh, people who have major traumas, especially in early childhood, tend to tend to look at magical experiences around them. How does trauma? Uh, a relate, relate to or amplify synchronistic experience? And thank you, uh, Kay Hecker. That is a super question. I'm, that is a super question. It's the first time anyone's asked me that question. I think it's a really super question. Um, and you know, I think it's, and I'm really, I, I wouldn't say happy because it's a little bit inappropriate to say that, but I, it's a really, um, I'm, I'm grateful that the experience of trauma is now at the forefront of lots of discussions within clinical circles. You know, I supervise um, interns, and it seems like they're getting so much more education on the nature of trauma, the dynamics of trauma, recovery of trauma than I got. You know, as a clinician during my training, it seems like it's a really, I'll say, hot topic. But you know, it, it is not completely new. But I'm really glad that there's a focus on it, and so I feel like. One of the um, aspects of trauma, right, is that it is, um, what's traumatic is that a consolidated structure of meaning and experience is shattered. So in a way I would call it a subset of liminal experiences. It's a liminal experience because your safety in your body, in your family, in your society, has been taken away. You are no longer in that place. And you haven't, if you've been traumatized, yet figured out how to reconsolidate that safety in your body, in your family, or in your society, right? We as clinicians see people who were physically, sexually abused. So their experience of trauma is somatic. It's in their body because of the actual abuse. They were traumatized interpersonally by familial abuse, emotional, verbal, behavioral abuse. Or I think it needs to be said, right? Due to all of the various forms of hatred and prejudice in the society, racism, misogyny, homophobia, people are traumatized socially. Their sense of safety and goodness in themselves has been attacked and disintegrated. And so there's a social trauma through the various kinds of hatred that you may have experienced, you know. So um, all three of those, you know, both the physical, the familial, the social trauma disintegrates the person. And so that's that's how I make sense. And this is, you know, as Kay is saying, I think my experience very much dovetails with what she's saying. My experience is that as particularly early childhood trauma, I think opens people up to a level of transpersonal experience because of that. You know, that does, because they're traumatized, it doesn't close it down in the course of their development. The trauma keeps that open. And it's, um, I'm not gonna say whether that's good or bad. It's just, that's the phenomenological explanation of it. I think it's essentially not something I would wish on anyone, obviously. And yet it is a source of giftedness in a particular way. It gives traumatized people insight to something that non-traumatized people don't have. And I know that, you know, because of course of my work, 
And sometimes that manifests itself in what she's describing. Because they're open, they have been ripped open in a particular way um, through uh, the trauma, which has not enabled them to actually consolidate their personality or their experience in ways until they actually fully heal. There's an openness they have to um, the universe, to life, to experiences that they can't shut off, particularly as kids. You know, they're not developed enough to shut it off. And so that's what happens. And I think what, the way that one goes then about treating it from, if you want to say this, a Jungian point of view, you know, from a Jungian direction is exactly what we're talking about tonight. I sit there and attempt to help them make a meaning of what occurred to them for themselves. That's the point of it. Now, we're not talking about synchronicity at this point because we're talking about the perpetration of a crime or abuse on someone, right? So it wasn't a, it wasn't a random event, but some traumas are random events. You know, um, you know, we're talking about a specific kind of, I'm just talking about a specific kind of trauma that I see most frequently, which is sort of abuse. But, you know, people who've been in car accidents, that's a completely random event. You know, uh, people that develop illnesses, you know, or traumatized by um, breast cancer, I, breast cancer, the treatment of breast cancer that they've gone through. I was thinking of a particular client, you know, who was in therapy because of, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder due to her breast cancer treatment. Um, those are random events in the sense that the, the client, the person themselves didn't cause it, it happened sort of to them. And yet it's traumatizing, right? It's traumatizing in the sense that it disintegrates the person's sense of basic safety in the world and opens them up. And so, you know, sometimes it is a random event. Sometimes in that sense, when we get to the end of it, and this is my late husband did his doctoral dissertation on the spiritual and religious transformation that occurred for people back in the 1980s when they got their AIDS diagnosis. So I was part of a whole research team of folks that talked to individuals who were diagnosed with HIV or at that time AIDS and what they made of it religiously or spiritually. And constantly we heard HIV was the best thing that happened to me spiritually, which sounds, you know, kind of on its face, completely outrageous, except the person is saying that. I'm not telling them that, they're telling me that. They're like, it forced me, that trauma forced me to look at pieces of who I was and what I did in my life and changed things. It made me look at a, a power greater than myself. What is beyond this life? All sorts of different issues when they face their own mortality. So the trauma of illness or the trauma of abuse can open someone up to a deeper level of experience than other folks have. And, um, and I think that's what it counts. That I think that's the way I talk about it because I guess I have had the same experiences, you know. In fact, it's gotten so common at this point so that when somebody comes in and actually has what we generally call psychic abilities, you know, the ability to kind of um, either foretell the future, some people do. <laughs> I've had a few prophetic dreams myself, I'll admit, um, or have uh, many of the synchronistic stories, for example, in the book about families are what we would call telepathic or shared, ex shared experience at a distance, you know, between the, the chapter I have on siblings and families, uh, particularly on siblings, the way that siblings at a distance would be experiencing the exact same thing. One is injured, the other one feels pain. So the psychic experiences, whenever I have someone that comes in for psychotherapy with a psychic abilities, I always think what Kay is talking about, like what was the early childhood trauma? You know, it's so common that the early childhood trauma pairs with someone's ability to perceive things. And so that's what happens. We make a meaning of it. Um, you know, I think a, a yet another, you know, another, uh, what I would say, kind of type of synchronistic event, which is stories, you know, as I've worked with um, the children of Holocaust survivors, I hear their stories of their parents or their grandparents making meaning of the events of the random events that occurred in the course of the Holocaust. You know, why was I taken and my sister, why was my sister taken and I wasn't? What happened to my parents? I have this 
a kind of amazing story within the book on families that I just published a couple of years ago of uh, an entire family's Holocaust, survived the Holocaust and sort of <clears throat> in the course of their researching what occurred to family members came across folks that they thought had died but hadn't. And they, and they came across their names in the Holocaust uh, records in Israel when they were looking completely by chance. They just happened to be, they just happened to see something in passing and followed the lead and found an entire wing of their family who they thought had perished, but had actually survived and were living in South America. So what happens is it, you know, that's why I started off by talking about trauma as a, a sort of a subset of liminal experience. And that is we are who we are. Trauma disintegrates that liminally and it is possible to recover to it is very possible to recover from trauma and reconsolidate but it requires making a meaning of what occurred to you and that's where i think trauma and synchronicity kind of you know what i've been talking about tonight make you know kind of make common cause i mean we're about making meaning of the random events of our lives you know <clears throat> whether it happens to be the trauma of an accident or an illness that happens to be the trauma of abuse that happens to be the trauma of political oppression. You know, all of those things I think um, are, you know, the traumas that I work with, with my clients to help them heal. So that's why they come to my mind immediately. So. Um, I think that uh, earlier you were emphasizing the, uh, the emotional impact, the causality element and the, uh, the time. Uh, element within uh, as coincidence, but um, I think that the element of meaning might be more important. Uh, uh, in Islamic mystical thought, the equivalent of the physical and the metaphysical, uh, well, in, uh, from, from their perspective, the metaphysical is still centered around physical. Mm -hmm. So right. physicality is given cent centrality, but in, in Islamic mystical thought, it's not so. The two levels are called the level of meaning and the level of senses. Uh -huh. So that the meaning is kind of loaded into this vessel of our archetypal beings when it transitions down to, to the mm. sense world. And when you look at it that way, I think there is also an element of um, uh, how is meaning encoded or decoded. And gotcha. uh, in, in the, in the prelingual uh, stage, we may not know how it really works, but at least uh, since we have acquired language, the language contains certain meanings or at least encodes meaning because that would be cultural. Right. Right. To take your example, for instance, if you had that therapy session with, with your patient, and if you were um, conducting that session, not in English, but say in a, uh, in a different language, for instance, French. In, in French, the word power, the psycho-spiritual power, right. and the word for electricity would be totally different. That's correct. In English, we use the word power for both. Right. But in some languages for electricity, they will not use power. No. So if, if your interview, uh, if your session was conducted in French, uh, he could have said, you know, uh, I, I don't have any power. And then the electricity goes out. It will be difficult to make that connection because the, the commonality of the linguistic terms are missing. That's correct. So I think that if we... Uh, if we include the, the how language encodes meaning, and then when we cannot decode the synchronicity unless we can get to a, a meaning, uh, uh, unless we can get a meaning out of it. If the meaning element is absent, there is no synchronicity. That's right. Because it That's doesn't right. mean, I mean, to use the simple plan, it has a meaning in it. Right. Uh, no, so um, I want to get your um, uh, 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 reflection response to, to this. 
Yeah, I, you know, you're you're absolutely right on. I mean, I have to say, and it's a, a beautiful, if articulate way of putting it, to tell you the truth. I guess it relates to the aspect that I sort of intuitively experienced in doing the research, which was to say that it's, you know, the way I might say it, given what you just talked about, is that it's only synchronistic if you can actually articulate a story about it. Like, in other words, if you can't make it into a narrative using language, then you can't actually experience the meaning. Like, in other words, what you're saying is language encodes the meaning. And that's what I guess that's sort of, or yeah, discloses the meaning of it. In other words, I think that's why when someone experiences it as meaningful internally, it erupts into a story. It sort of almost like has to be expressed. But if they can't express it, yeah, the meaning then is, um, Jung would say, I think, that the meaning lays in the unconscious. It's not that it's meaningless, but that the meaning isn't accessible to the person. And I think that's what you're really, I think, putting on, putting your finger on a super important point, which Jung doesn't really go into very much. And I think subsequent Jungians, including myself, have not gone into very much, but is a really important aspect of this. Like if you can't articulate the meaning, you know, does it does a tree make a sound if it falls in the forest? Is an event meaningless? Is a is an event meaningful if you can't actually express the meaning linguistically in a, in the in the form of a story? I wanted to ask you a question, though. I think I think you described the relationship between the physical and the metaphysical in Islamic mysticism, and I wanted to make sure I got clear <clears throat> in that way in that way of describing it. Is there a discontinuity between the spiritual and the physical, it sounded like there was a discontinuity. In other words, the metaphysical is loaded into the physical and then we spend our lives decoding it. And it sounds to me like there wasn't a continuity between the physical and the metaphysical. There was a discontinuity and I wasn't sure if I understood that correctly. Uh, no, there is a continuity, but there's also a, a transition. So if we had to connect that to the synchronistic uh, element of it would be, uh, since the divine is beyond time and, and we are in a sense victims of a, a, a linear time perspective. Right. And that's why when in the, in the linear time perspective, we see two things occurring at the same time, we think it's synchronistic. Right. Whereas uh, from the other side, uh, there is no linear time. Okay. So everything is happening at at once, uh, or right. everything is happening at all times, and therefore, uh, on that side, everything is synchronistic. Right. Exactly. So we lose that synchronicity from the level of meaning into the sense world when we are—I uh, don't know if I can use the word—when we are victimized by this linear time perspective. We have no right. choice. We are kind of locked into linear time and therefore the synchronicity does not occur unless somehow uh, once in a while under the circumstances that you describe when right. the veil is lifted right and we look to the other side and we say yeah of course everything makes sense all things could happen at right. the same time right yeah i think that you know one one person one writer thinker, philosopher, I think, that knits up everything you and I are talking about in one particular way is Paul Ricoeur. You know, his books, uh, Time and Narrative, in other words, looks at the way in which narrative creates time for the reasons you're talking about. It, on one level, linear time doesn't exist. We experience it and create narrative. And by that narrative, it's one way that we can sort of look beneath. You know, there's a way that it creates a kind of timelessness by, by our telling the story and connecting to the metaphysical transpersonal meaning of it that's beyond time. And so that's sort of you know, another way of, of, of talking about and researching, I'd say kind of exploring the notions that you and I are talking about right now. You know, the, the, the relationship between narrative, time, meaning, and 
God, eternity, you know, the metaphysical realm, you know, the realm that's beyond all of us. That's why I said I like the concept because it opens up. There's a there's a number of different um, folks within the Jungian camp that have gone in that direction with it, have gone in the direction of what is this? What is the metaphysical? What is the metaphysical meaning of Jung's ideas of synchronicity? You know, Jung stayed on this side of the line, or perhaps in in earlier cultures. I think that. Uh, the the uh, when time was assigned divinity right. you know like in chronos yeah, or in yeah, zervanism yeah. Uh, the idea was time and and a lot of the uh, early forms of religion organized religion like the worship of the sun it wasn't the sun per se but the sun was a measure of time and so yeah. therefore whether it was the sun the moon or all the other things that people started to worship the the central element in it was time and that uh, it was within this time that we had been sort of confined and so uh, i i don't know if we can trace this back uh, into a, a much much earlier times um when 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 god was time so to say and yeah, yeah. Um, for someone uh, with a name like Zaman, which means time, I, I, I better <laughs> end my comment. <laughs> there it is. Thank you so um, much. I'm thinking that uh, just watching the clock, <laughs> no pun accidental, wind down, I was wondering if we might shift from uh, talking about God and synchronicity, and I was hoping that Connie could help us mix in a conversation about the shadow and synchronicity, which I'm sure that many of us are wondering if, if we can get to. Um, there have been a couple of things on my mind. I didn't know if we were going to get to me because we, I thought we were calling in the audience, but one, one is, you know, the pandemic has thrown us all into liminality and it's, um, it hasn't occurred to me that there might be a lot of synchronicity going on because of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, I mean, I, there's no way to track it. But it seems so like such a possible route to finding meaning in this collective liminal space that we're living in. Right. Any thoughts about that? Well, I mean, what you know, I've been I've been seeing clients through this entire period, right? So it, it's one of these examples of the worst thing that happened to you if you work with it some could disclose new directions or ways in which you need to go that you always thought you should or could, but now have to, whether you like it or not. So I don't know how synchronistic some of it actually is to tell you the truth, but you know, sort of synchronicity writ large in some ways, you know, the randomness of it, I think is very, um, potent for people it's certainly a level of you know certainly behind the level of fear you know oh my god you know it seems pretty random you know people yeah. who take protection people who take precautions get sick people who are running around not don't you know so i think the randomness of it you know it makes it a pretty existential kind of experience i reread camus the plague in the course of I this you know right i, I mean i feel like yeah. you know you have to right i mean it's really a very cogent way of exploring the human reaction to an event like this. Yep. What I will say is with the clients and, you know, is uh, I don't know how synchronistic this is to tell you the truth, but uh, rafts of people I know personally and in and, and my practice are, people have asked me, how are your clients doing? And weirdly, I would say my clients are doing better than a lot of my friends. And my clients are doing better than a lot of my friends, not because they, you know, have, in fact, they don't have greater resources, but they're in therapy trying to make a meaning and figure out a direction actively and take control of the situation to the extent they can. And my friends have not been doing that. They haven't been really doing their work around it. So my clients have actually made a lot of really important changes in their life um, on the basis of this situation, you know, ended jobs, ended relationships, uh, uh, took the advantage of the disruption to make major changes moved somewhere else, got out, cashed in their chips, did really sort of positive things. You know, and I have to say like the social disruption 
broke open the possibility of stuff that um, a continued routine would not have, you know? But I think what that, you know, it's not so much that any of this was particularly synchronistic, but it's a little bit like the attitude that Jung or I or you want to foster in our clients with regard to random events that occur to their life. Let's look at what it means. Let's look at what you can make it mean for yourself and let's move on that meaning. So that's what I would say. You know, I, I mean, that's certainly been my experience. Um, you know, not that it's all, you know, not that anyone's had a great experience. No one would ever have wanted any of this to happen. But, you know, but it's very much like, you know, you know, I was in a plane crash or I had, a, you know, a terminal diagnosis and it slapped me in the face and made me look at what was important and turned me around in a particular way. You know, that the worst thing that ever happened was the best thing that ever happened, quote unquote, you know, what I would say. So that's what I've seen. I heard a lot of stories of that. And so that's what I... That's what I bring to someone of my feckless friends. And I'm just like, okay, look at y'all need to do your work here, you know? So you need to start facing some of this stuff and, you know, turning it around. So that's great. Thanks. You're welcome. Other, other, uh, I'm going to let Will continue to. Well, moderate. I'm hoping to hear from Boris. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Oh, hi, Robert. Um, hey there. Thanks a lot for the uh, presentation uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, what I want to stick with, and this is one of the reasons, is that if there were a tape of your presentation, it actually doesn't center around discovery meaning. It is the making, the doing of meaning. Yeah. Right? I agree with that. And as a philosopher, as a, a one who's a heretical philosopher, and what that means is philosophers tend to be interested in what a concept means, but rhetoricians are interested in what a concept does. Mm. I want to ask you more about, to, to ask you about synchronicity in terms of, isn't it more than the expression of the story that is made is actually the doing of the story. Right? Yeah, because I would agree. It has its own kind of limits, right? If you ask John Cage, the uh, avant-garde right. composer, he would say that asked about the meaning of a song is not to understand a song. Right, right. But again, right. you go back to doing, 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 and that offers to me possibilities that one can engage these kinds of Right. of uh, no, or these kind of occurrences in their life. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense, you know, and I have to say that's, you know, you're pointing out what I would call the limitations of my profession, right? Because we sit in session and talk. Which, okay. then, the then the client gets up and does. Now, I, I, happen to <laughs> I happen to have the reputation among my colleagues of, um, calling clients on not doing between the sessions, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, I'm a doer. And I think, so that's what I have to say. So, you know, what you're pointing out, because I'm discussing this from within a psychotherapeutic framework is exactly that. But as a philosopher, as an artist, right? I would just point out that, you know, what Jung often had clients do was do, create artworks from their inner meaning and you know get them into you know that's santre there's you know different kinds of ways that's why i think jungian psychotherapy is especially wonderful for folks who are in the arts mm -hmm. because we're comfortable with symbolic understandings and do i think completely understand what you just said which is sure you can reflect and you can work with internally but in the end the point is to create a life not just to talk about it mm. so you know that's what i have to say you know in psychotherapy we tee folks up to do leave and actually do the work that they need to do you know to live their life to kind of make a to live their lives to do their work to engage in relationships to make an actual meaning through doing it's really that's 
a great horse. I'm going to actually borrow that to tell you the truth. That's so wonderful. That's a great way to put it, you know, because I guess that's what happens. I mean, I think, but, you know, we're in the, that's why, I, as I said earlier, throughout this talk, I consider psychotherapy a liminal space. In other words, it's the second stage of the three. There's the third stage afterwards, and that's what you're speaking to. Yes, I am. But and and, and I guess I should stop here and just take the compliment. <laughs> but I wanted to push it a little further because um, I think you're right. But I'm not just critiquing. I'm not critiquing talking. I'm all for that. As a rhetorician, talking is what. <laughs> Right. I'm not just I'm not critiquing that. I think what I'm getting at too, in terms of what I've heard, the way you've been talking in your discourse, is the nature of knowledge. It's very Western to talk about knowledge as being discovered, but yeah. you're talking about knowledge as being produced. It's a whole different notion of epistemology that I think is really important. So that's what I was getting at too. Uh, no. I have no problem with talking, but because we, we all understand that language by definition falls <clears throat> short. That, that comes with the territory, so that's okay. Yeah. But again, I really love the way you're talking about knowledge as being produced, as being manufactured, not as being just discovered. Does that mean well, that? I would not, I, I have to hand that to Jung. That okay. is actually the way Jung talks about it. Okay. I'm just describing how Jung talks about it. That's not me. <laughs> Jung, and that's why I love Jung. I have to say, for the same reason you're excited about the idea of like, oh my gosh, knowledge is produced. And I like, guess that's mm -hmm. what that's what that's what Jung, that's how Jung understands it too. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what I have to say. That's the point of an analysis. The point of an analysis is to enable the production of it. That's what we're talking about. That is pure, that's not me. That is all Jung. That is one of the geniuses that I think Jung came upon. You know, and I think a lot of deaf psychologists too, you know what I mean? But Jung in particular in a way that's kind of cleaner or clearer than say Freud. You know, Freud thought he knew what the meaning was and wanted to lead the client to an interpretation that would enable them to discover it, right? I mean, and um, Jung, didn't, Jung felt it was the way you and I are talking. Like, the psyche exists as, as its own sort of, what am I gonna say, nuclear generator. Mm -hmm. And it produces the meaning. And what Jung thought analysis was, was simply a facilitation of that production, uh, facilitation of that production, right? Which is why it's so amenable to creative uh, people. You know, like it doesn't shut down their process, it opens up their process. And that's what, you know, symbols, which are, the I would say kind of the basic quantum of Jung's idea of the psyche is an endless source of knowledge, right? It's it it that's what I say. It's a wonder you what you just said was just a wonderful way of restating one of I think one of the genius insights of Jung that knowledge isn't discovered, it's produced. And that is the purpose of it. And you're right, yeah, I I didn't take anything you said as a critique, you know, at all. I mean in fact Kind of, kind of the opposite. I mean, you made kind of very forcefully made the point that in rhetoric, language does, language produces, right? I mean, that's that's the purpose of rhetoric. That's fine. <laughs> I'm happy with what I'm not, I'm happy with what I do. But you know, that's what I have to say. Like, that's one form of production. Artwork's another form of production. Music's another. Form, dance is another. You know, like in other words, I think, yeah, that's a great way to put it. And I think, you know, I like I said, I'm going to borrow that. Because people come, you know, as I said earlier in the talk, people come to me with their synchronistic events. And they say, tell me what it means. And I'm going to say, um, meaning isn't discovered. Meaning is produced. Hmm. <laughs> talk to Boris. I'm like, that's a great way to put it. I'm like, seriously, I'm totally borrowing that. And uh, I will credit you, but that, that's a great way to put it. I mean, I seriously, you know, tell me what it means, you know, in this passive sense. I'm like, no, sorry, you've got to produce the meaning. You know, it isn't just discovered, so. Thanks and it's beyond mind. concepts. And it can, and it's beyond concepts. That's right. I mean, ultimately it is. You know, that's where we get to the limitation of language or the story. It, that's one of the aspects too, I think of synchronistic events sometimes that happens, which is in the moment they have a particular meaning. And then as time goes on and life and experience continues, those events sometimes take on other meanings 
you know, in newer capacities. In other words, a single a single conception of it isn't static and eternal. It's dynamic, and so that points to a way in which the meaning is beyond, you know, the particular concept of it we might have at any given single moment. You know, as life goes on, some events that I look back on, I'm like, I didn't. Sometimes that's also some of the stories I tell. Sometimes events occur, and they and the meaning of them only be is disclosed sometimes many years later. They don't really even know. Many stories about uh, in the family book, the book about family stories of synchronicity have to do with things that people discovered, commonalities they discovered with ancestors that had lived centuries before that had incredible meaning for them. You know, so the idea that somehow the meaning of it, it exists beyond concept is absolutely cogent, you know, and very relevant to the experience of synchronicity, so. Well, Rob, I think that one of the things that we have to do in relating to synchronicity is we have to say yes. And a lot of times what happens is that things <clears throat> blow by us and our minds either understand them or associate them with something. But I think of the synchronous ev synchronistic events that brought Will and me together to uh, developed the myth salon and how we have responded according to that. We could sit here for the rest of the evening and this is such a fabulous conversation. You said yes when we approached you. Right. And without saying yes, we really don't have a marriage. We don't have a, a melding together. And so I would like to put out a really sincere, heartfelt thanks to all of the people who have showed up, who have, who fed us questions. We've tried to work some of them in, but this is a much bigger topic. Right. And maybe what we could do is keep you on the back burner and come back again in six months during a warmer time and say, you know, we all had a, such a great time. We want to get Rob back here. I'm, I'm drawn to what happens when we put ourselves out and we say, we ask the world, we ask one another, will you come play with me? Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna close out with a little bit of a closing ritual, but I wanna invoke the name of a new, very good friend that I have named Jonathan Staggers. Many of you are now aware that I have embarked upon a project to develop and interpret the 81 verses of the Tao Te Ching. Hmm. And this came about only because I heard Jonathan's voice. I wasn't looking to do a project. I wasn't in the mood to do a project, but I heard his voice. And if you, I have now produced the first nine of them, and they're up on YouTube. Uh -huh. and, and if you go on YouTube and just do Tao Te Ching, they'll show up. His voice is magical. But we're magical together. And this is a combined collaboration that is just deepening with every time we get together. One, a path that can be walked is not the Tao, it is not the way. A name that can be named is not the name, it is not the Tao. The Tao is both named and nameless. The nameless originates heaven and earth the beginning of all that is. The named mothers the 10,000 things. A mind freed from thought and desires can see the mysteries. Reflected only by its own perceptions, 
the mind mirrors the forms of existence. Merging within itself and connecting to all that is, the mind beholds both the essence of the Tao and its manifestations arising from the same source. Tao and existence may appear different, but in truth, it is only the human mind that separates itself from the whole, from which it bestows names upon the nameless. The Tao is truth within the truth, the being inside all existence, the way beneath all directions. And so as I'm thinking of who we are as individuals within a community and how we're interweaved and interwoven into one another's lives, we're living out the thing that we're talking about. We're putting that doing into action. We're, when you talked about how we are participating within the, in the psyche, I hear that as the Tao. I hear, mm. I hear the psyche as, as being the condition of heaven and earth that is uniting all of us and that we are the ones who separate ourselves from it, that mm -hmm. the Tao is including all of us. Mm -hmm. And as I'm interpreting these verses, I'm just going, wow, this is what I've been brought here for. And it's just an amazing feeling when he and I get together. So with that, having thanked everyone and I thank you Rob I just this, this has been so deep and meaningful and I thank Boris and Connie and Chris nice to meet you I, I you you've got to come back you you're you're we got to get <laughs> you back in here and Zaman and Clay and Selena and Will I I just what a family that we we are bringing to this and and the comments that I receive from people about this and thank you all for this I'd like to go out quietly, simply. I'd like to do a closing with the singing bowl and to reflect upon the transformation that I think awaits us in the coming months. We're gonna be off for Thanksgiving. We're coming back on December 3rd for Voris with a talk on the, deep, on the dark feminine. On December 17th, we'll let you know we're going to have a very special one. It's going to be a different kind of a miss salon, but trust me, it'll be a nice one. And um, so with that, let's have a moment of silence and let's go forth and love our community. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for coming in tonight. Really meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you.